We're on the eve of the start of the holiday weekend, and we thank you for joining us for today's Two on Your Side Town Hall. I'm Michael Wooten. And I'm Mary Alice Demler. We always like to remind you about our text line so you can send us your questions and comments. The number is 849 2200. And later, we answer quite a few of the questions that you've sent us this week. First today, though, we want to take a deep dive into the economy because there was a lot of news on the jobs front today. Yeah, the big headline from the Euro U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics today, we found out that in the month of June last month, the economy added 4.8 million jobs. That was better than expected and brought down the unemployment rate. Wall Street responded with stocks up a bit. Yeah, the Dow Jones Industrial Average finished up almost 100 points in the green. Here's how President Trump described this jobs report. These are historic numbers in a time that uh, a lot of people would have wilted. They would have wilted, but we didn't wilt and our country didn't wilt. And I'm very honored to be your president. Thank you very much. Some opti optimism from the president there, but there's also growing concern as some states have paused or even rolled back their reopenings because cases are spiking across the country. Yeah, the president argued our reopening is more successful than anyone could have imagined. But take a look at that number on your screen right now. Yesterday, the states collectively reported more than 50,000 new confirmed cases of coronavirus. That is the most in a single day, a new and troubling record. Joining us right now to help make sense of all this is Mark Hamrick. Mark is the senior economic analyst and Washington bureau chief for bankrate.com. Mark, thanks for being here. Great to be with you, Mary Alice and Michael. Mark, it's good to see you again. I want to start by showing our viewers the unemployment rate in this country over the past year. As you know very well, we had historically low rates, below 4% all the way through March, and then it just skyrocketed. We had 15% of Americans out of work in the month of April. Now we're seeing this kind of steady decline, now down to 11%. Of course, still very high, and our thoughts are with all of those people who have lost their jobs. What does this unemployment figure that we learned today tell you about where we are in this recovery? Yes, well, you know, for all those millions of Americans and two thirds of those who lost their jobs uh, during this downturn remain unemployed. We basically recaptured a third of those 22 million jobs lost. Uh, this is a catastrophe unlike anything we've seen in our lifetimes with respect to an economic downturn. Uh, the jobless rate at its peak during the financial crisis and Great Recession was 10%. And by the way, the Labor Department tells us that, in truth, the most recent unemployment rates 1% higher because of problems they've had measuring. But so it's actually closer to 12%. So uh, there's a lot of suffering out there across the nation and in Western New York. Well, Mark, the unemployment rate going down really is undoubtedly really good news. But there is something that is causing some concern as well. We still had almost one and a half million more Americans filing initial claims for unemployment last week. Now, the number has gone down from late April, but there are still a lot of people losing their jobs. And now, as we mentioned, some states are pausing or reversing their reopenings. How concerned should we be about that, Mark? I'm very concerned about it, Mary Alice. Uh, this monthly employment data we get is captured around the second week of the month. Just so happens that uh, the renewed outbreaks of COVID-19 we've been seeing around the country have occurred in the second half of the month of June. That means that there is a risk that once we get the July jobless data, that we may not make as much progress as we have before. You're right, the weekly jobless claims improved, still remain remarkably elevated and have improved over 13 straight weeks. But we're really zeroing in now on about a total of 50 million claims that have been filed. So uh, again, it's a, it's a remarkably dire situation. We welcome each and every job added as, as we saw those uh, many jobs added in the latest month, nearly 5 million, but we have more work to do. We've done so many stories, Mark, unfortunately, here in New York, and we see them across the country of people who have been trying to apply for unemployment and haven't even finished that process. So those numbers may not even fully capture all of it. Um, want to look forward to what's next right now, and I want to get your reaction to what the Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin said earlier today during President Trump's briefing. Listen to this. 
I'm already having conversations with certain members of Democrats and Republicans to get ideas. We're very focused on, as part of the next CARES Act, we're going to seriously consider whether we need to put more payments and direct payments over. Worked very well. So Secretary Mnuchin saying that we could see another round of direct payments. We know them as the stimulus checks. Uh, we don't know what the dollar figure would be right now. We don't know exactly who would qualify. Um, the president also mentioned today a possible payroll tax cut. Um, do you think we need another round of stimulus? And if so, what might be the most effective form of that in improving the economy? Well, getting aid directly into the hands of Americans, particularly those who are out of work, is the most efficient way of doing that. And we need to keep enterprises whole so they can keep people employed. A payroll tax cut helps those who are employed. So that doesn't help the unemployed. That helps the broader economy, which may need some help as well. Uh, but I feel like that's a politically uh, palatable solution for this administration and not something that helps those who are in need. Uh, if anything, I think that there has been a sense of less urgency on the part of elected officials in Washington as they're cheerleading on these numbers. Uh, it feels like they're essentially viewing the situation as less urgent than they had before. And last question, Mark. Today, the president said the third quarter will break all records in terms of economic growth and same with next year. However, there are some health experts predicting a tough fall with the flu season coinciding with a possible second wave. What is the economic forecast as we look forward, or is that really not even possible to do right now? Well, we need to forecast because we want to have some benchmarks. But as has been the case all along, the most important thing that has informed the economic assumption making has been the performance of the virus and the, the reactions to it and eventually the solutions. We believe there'll be multiple vaccines available perhaps late this year, early next. We need to have them be safe and effective and available. Uh, I would say that we can expect a rebound, uh, but to call it a historic rebound is really to lose context because we had a historic downturn. About a month from now, when we get the measures of uh, second quarter GDP, uh, that will be historic in by all magnitude in the sense of right now the consensus is we'll see an annualized decline in GDP for the second quarter of about 30%. So a rebound from that is really like having been deeply behind in a football game and perhaps scoring one touchdown when you need to score four more. Really great analysis there. Mark Hamrick, Senior Economic Analyst and Washington Bureau Chief for Bankrate.com. We are so fortunate that you took some time to join us. Have a great weekend, Mark. Thank you. Well, we want to turn to another economic question that we've gotten a lot lately. How is it that the government can just keep printing money to stimulate the economy? That or what rather is the long term impact of that? Yeah, already we are seeing how the pandemic has messed with the prices of a lot of things we buy, right? You might be paying more for toilet paper and hand sanitizer, but you're paying a lot less for gas and we could see even more of that. So tonight, an explanation on why. As our economy sails through COVID and all of its unknowns, one of the biggest questions is, what will the pandemic do to our money? I don't mean the stock market. The price of a share of Apple has no impact at all on a typical person's life. But the price of an actual Apple? Now we're talking about putting food on the table. Economists watch the price of that Apple and a whole bunch of other stuff we buy to see if the cost of living goes up. That's inflation and it means every dollar you have is worth a little bit less. Normally, we expect a little inflation over a long period of time. When Gramps tells you, I remember when going to the pictures used to cost 50 cents, he's not making it up. One dollar really did buy two movie tickets back in the 1950s. Today, it's closer to $20. But what if, in just the next year or so, your 50 cent apple cost more? Not just double, keep going, what if the dollar became so worthless you needed thousands, even a half million bucks to buy an apple? That's hyperinflation. It's not make-believe, it's happening right now in Venezuela. While U.S. inflation has been running less than 2%, Venezuela's is 10 million percent by some estimates. The Venezuelan Bolivar is so worthless, people throw stacks of money in the streets as protests. Hyperinflation is a vicious cycle. Everyone expects prices to keep going up, so they try to buy things before that happens. More demand, less supply, higher prices. That's why it's called runaway inflation. 
You won't find many economists who expect Venezuela-level inflation here in the U.S., but some worry inflation could get pretty bad because the government is printing so much money in this pandemic. Print enough, the theory goes, you'll water down the value of a dollar and set off inflation. Other economists predict the opposite, deflation, lower prices. That can happen on its own in a down economy when people buy less and save more. If people see prices fall and believe they'll keep falling, they don't buy things, they just wait. That's stagflation, a big slowdown of the economy that can destroy jobs. The Federal Reserve has tools it can use to try to keep inflation around that nice smooth 2%. Still, a lot of economics is theory. We can't tell you for certain where the value of your money will go. But now you know what the experts are watching for on the horizon. The most uncertain times, really, as far as the economy is concerned in our nation's history. It's no wonder, Michael, so many people have so much anxiety right now. Yeah, and so many moving parts. And mm -hmm. Mark said there, you know, you have to make a forecast, um, but there's not a whole lot of confidence in any of the forecasts right now because we don't even know what's going to happen with this virus. Yeah. And that honestly is what is going to determine pretty much everything. Yeah, it's so true. Everyone's watching so closely, you know, the reports of the vaccines and how those are progressing yeah. and we will keep you up to date here. 